This month on 219 West, with St. Patrick's Day around the corner, we take a look at Irish American communities in New York City. Take the 7 train to 61st Street in Woodside and you'll step into a little patch of Ireland. Also, a young Irish novelist came to the States to write the great American novel and wound up writing a really great American novel. Roshana Rapkins talks to Colin McCann. And Margaret Teich catches up with a new generation of Irish dancers who are following in their parents' footsteps. Hello and welcome to this month's edition of 219 West, the monthly news magazine produced by students at the CUNY Graduate School of Journalism for CUNY TV. I'm David Montalvo. And I'm Jessica Cordemosh. Also in this edition of 219 West, Island to Island, Mary Grace Murphy listens in as Irish writers and musicians come out in support of Haitian relief efforts. And speaking of cultural preservation, French-speaking parishioners in Chelsea are trying to save their 150-year-old church. But we begin this show by talking St. Patrick's Day. This year, because of the sluggish economy, the city is scaling back on all parades and festivities by 25%. Events like the 4th of July and Macy's Thanksgiving Parade will be more modest. As luck would have it, the cuts take effect on April 1st, two weeks after St. Patrick's Day. This 249-year-old parade is a testament to the resiliency of the Irish identity in New York City. One place where that identity is still visible is a community in Western Queens. Woodside is a residential neighborhood of approximately 90,000 people. With its large Asian American and Latino populations, Woodside is the microcosm of the city's diversity. Historically, Woodside has been the largest Irish American community in Queens. Today, Irish Americans and expatriates alike are still very much a presence of the neighborhood they settled in nearly a century ago. Peter McDermott is a writer for the Irish Echo, one of the two local newspapers that cover the Irish American community in the city. McDermott no longer lives in Woodside, but he learned a great deal about the neighborhood as a resident and as a journalist. Woodside was his beat. On a chilly Sunday, McDermott took me on a tour of the neighborhood. So they sell, of course, there's the publications which are from here for the Irish community. Yes. Which you work for and then there's also you were telling me this is well that's the Sunday Independent that's uh, possible I think that's the biggest selling uh, newspaper on the Sunday and I think the biggest selling overall in, in, in Ireland besides newspapers from the old country Irish Americans can also get a taste of Ireland in their local delis there's a you know juice in Dublin so so this is, these are food imports, mm -hmm. so people like their particular types of bread and sauces and so on. We're outside the Starting Gate pub here in Woodside and uh, uh, the popular pastime for people is to go to uh, bars to watch games from being broadcast live from Ireland or England in the case of these games here, Liverpool versus Blackburn Rovers. Uh, Sunderland versus, uh, can't see that now, but uh, Fulham and uh, also rugby, Ireland played rugby again, beat England yesterday in rugby, so they've come, <laughs> they've come to see that, as well, and also Gaelic football games from, uh, from Ireland too. This is uh, the main parish church uh, in Woodside, mm -hmm. and uh, it would have been Irish dominated uh, for a long time, when, when it was an Irish, Irish dominated neighbourhood. And uh, now you see a much greater mix, you know, uh, people like uh, Mexican immigrants and so on might be the more uh, populous group now going to church. But the Irish people are still still going to church. Also, in terms of the, the role of the church would be seen as, um, on the immigration question, ten the church is, tends to be very pro uh, the plight, you know, pro-immigrant, it's generally seen as that. Uh, whether it's Irish or Mexican or anybody else, uh, it's te it has taken up the cause of the illegal immigrants and is, is pro-immigrant ref uh, reform. But generally speaking, I suppose the, the church would not have the same hold on people that it would have had in previous decades. I think younger people are uh, have to some extent moved away and uh, levels of practice would be much lower than it would have been. 
Back in the 1930s, Woodside was over 80% Irish. With immigration now dwindling down, that is no longer the case. So now we're here in front of the Emerald Isle Immigration Center. So can you tell us a little bit more about what the center is all about? Yeah, this is set up, uh, well, it's 1994 here on the plaque, but I know it definitely existed before that. Um, the, this was set up for uh, immigrants, initially Irish immigrants, uh, who needed help getting a job or needed help getting um, uh, accommodation. Uh, just need, you know, uh, just contacts generally, and any kind of advice they needed. And so this was set up by Irish American Irish people in the community here, and uh, it um, now serves all immigrant groups. So anybody, you don't have to be Irish to go in and ask for, uh, you know, advice. And it was, it's particularly good. It's known for its. Um, help with uh, visa applications and uh, citizen applications and so on. So tell me a little bit, now we're going to go back in history, about the labor unions and those kind of movements, the correlation with that and the Irish immigrants in the community. Well, there's always a strong uh, link between the Irish and uh, the, labor, the labor movement. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's one of those areas that, uh, where you could say that the Irish uh, influence in terms of leadership positions and so on was disrep disproportionately high. The church was one area, politics for a long time, and also the labor movement. Um, so yeah, th there's always that strong connection. And that was, that was uh, reaffirmed with the 1980s immigrants uh, because they, a lot of them were involved in construction work. And uh, so they, they, they became uh, union members. Mm -hmm. So that link uh, stayed quite strong. In the heart of Woodside is a memorial containing the names of 28 young men from the neighborhood who lost their lives during the Vietnam War. The man down there in the uh, Catholic War Veterans Post, mm -hmm. he said that uh, 28 people had uh, died, mm -hmm. had been killed in action in the, in the Vietnam War, and it was the highest zip code in, uh, for any zip code in the United States, 11377. McDermott says that the Irish community is proud of the contribution and sacrifices it has made to this country. I asked him, what about the stereotype, particularly around St. Patrick's Day, of the drunken Irishman? I mean, the, the, Irish, uh, the, the Irish relationship to drink, it's, the Irish more likely to celebrate it. They don't drink any more than anybody else. They joke about it and, and joke about its downsides and so on, much more than probably other people would. Uh, but sometimes the stereotypes can be carried too far and, the, and the, the talk about it can be carried too far. So what other ways that don't involve drinking um, are there to celebrate St. Paddy's Day? Uh, well, most of them don't involve drinking. Uh, and that's just getting together with people. People, go, people are, will go to church on St. Patrick's Day. They'll get together, have a meal with, with their family. Uh, so that's it's just getting together uh, and making some people, you know, people make it a special day. It's like any other special day. Interestingly enough, David, Woodside actually celebrated their own St. Patrick's Day parade 10 days before the big one in Manhattan. That sounds like a really great pre-party to me. From historic names like Joyce, Wilde, and Yeats, to contemporary ones like the late Frank McCourt and Nobel Prize winning poet Seamus Heaney, Ireland has produced a host of internationally acclaimed writers. 219 West, Roshana Rapkins catches up with one of them. Roshana? Thanks, David. Colin McCann is the latest link in this literary chain. McCann came to the U.S. more than 20 years ago and teaches at the MFA program at Hunter College. His latest novel, Let the Great World Spin, has been called the first great 9-11 novel by Esquire magazine. I asked him how he felt about his most recent prize, the 2009 National Book Award the most extraordinary honor. I mean, there's Don DeLillo, there's William Faulkner, um, there is, uh, you know, there's a whole roll call of, of American literature. I was the only the third foreign-born um, author ever to get there. So um, to me, it was a surprise, and um, I feel sort of inordinately lucky in many ways. Um, and yet, the, 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 the most important thing is that you put your head down and, 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 and continue going, uh, because uh, the only thing that really matters in the very deep, deep end is the next book and what, and, and what the next book will do. Um, 
and you know to capture what, what, whatever it is that you want to do. With that particular uh, novel, I wanted to capture uh, the the music of the the city, this sort of symphonic intent. You'll hear the sirens going on outside now. Here when, when I speak this way. <laughs> originally you had the aspiration of writing the great American novel and usually we talk about that a little bit sort of self-consciously um, did you really have like a when you came to the United States is, is that, oh, that is was it? just a young man's folly just uh, I mean the idea was you know I was 20 years old I was like any 20 year old I thought I was gonna go and I'm gonna come to New York and like you know wear a big black overcoat and a beret and swan into these publishing parties to say I'm here and then I got a good rude kick in the teeth which was just great it's an important thing to have and so um, I got lots of rejections for many many years and and I moved and I took a bicycle across the United States and then I worked for juvenile delinquents down in Texas then I went to Japan and I went back to Ireland all in the sort of search of them um, some sort of voice or some sort of um, uh, ability to write a novel. Now I don't think in terms of like great American novels or great Irish novels or you know just want to tell hopefully what a good profound interesting story that uh, in some way gets under people's skin and turns their hearts backwards a little bit um, and I think that's that, that I mean that's the most important thing. It's also a, it's a higher goal and a lesser goal as well at the same time. Um, it's both of those things at once. Were you ever thinking of going back to Ireland um, at the point when you were encountering frustrations? When I was growing up there were you know if you left Ireland say in the 60s certainly I, uh, before I was born in the 50s, 40s, 50s, 30s, and you came to the United States, you came and uh, you stayed, and they would have an American wake for you. Okay, so the, you you would be present at your own funeral, more or less. It was, it's an extraordinary notion. Um, by the time I got around to, to, to leaving, which was like um, the 80s, that generation that had been around in the 70s and 80s, they weren't leaving in the same way anymore. Immigration didn't, 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 it, it cut into the fabric of society but didn't have the same uh, effect. You always knew that you could come back. Now, I mean, 2000, 2010, you can go back and forth for a weekend and, and the whole na nature of leaving has changed. Um, so I don't really feel that I've entirely left. I've gone to a new space. That new space happens to be New York and, but that's, and a space that I love. But um, whether or not I uh, have emigrated, I don't think I've emigrated or whether I'm in exile or anything, I don't, I don't, I don't think that that's uh, you know, my place. So it's, you become a sort of person of many countries, you know, which is something that interests me, and a lot of us are in that that that, that right now, you know, um, whether it be young people who are, you know, say somebody who's born in Spain and then educated in England and then uh, lived in Guatemala for a few years and comes to the United States and, you know, who are you? And it's, it's, it's one of the great questions. But I heard a rumor that you may be working on a novel that's exploring these themes of like Irish and American identity. I don't know where you heard that rumor. I thought I heard you say it. <laughs> well, yeah, I'm interested in, 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 in um, uh, going home, if you will. Um, in other words, going back to Ireland. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily to my own, um, you know, because I grew up in the suburbs and in, in Dublin. And um, I've written a bit about that recently because just things have changed for me and I've started writing about my father and my mother, uh, um, things that happened to me growing up. Uh, for many years, I wasn't writing about that sort of stuff because I found them sort of profoundly uninteresting, because they were they, th there was a, a happiness there. Now I'm sort of going for a different texture and see if that texture can lift off the page and see if I can tell some of those stories. But really, what I want to do is tell tell a bigger, broader story. One actually that hopefully the, the novel I'm working on takes place in during the Irish Famine in the 1840s, uh, with American characters that actually go back go to Ireland. Um, at that particular time, so I would explore. Uh, I would explore my own past that way. I mean, in the end, even though my philosophy is that you should write about what you don't know, or write towards what you want to know, in the end, in the deep, deep, deep end, uh, you can only write what you know, and it's, uh, that's the that, that's the only possibility for how you throw a word on the page. You write what you know. So. Yeah, because I've always known that, that you are not an armchair researcher. You know, you don't spend hours in the library. Um, you go out and you put yourself in the situation. So, 
I know for Zola you visited a Romani camp, and for a dancer about the right life of Nerea, uh, I believe you you practiced ballet for a year. <laughs> no? Am I wrong? No, I practiced ballet for an afternoon. I mean, look at me. Oh, an afternoon? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh. But I, w I went and hung out in ballet studios and stuff like that. No, I love research. I love research. And, and um, I love getting, you know, because you live, can live outside your life. One of the functions of literature is to sort of live outside your own immediate narrow confinements um, so you can become anybody. You can, you know, you know, you can leap into another body, into another time, into another culture. Because I, I have an idea that 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 that, that you know, um, one of the one of the great escapes, one of the great journeys that we can do, is not necessarily go to the moon, or not necessarily go to Santiago, or you know, take a yacht across the, the across the world, or walk from one side of the country to the other. It, one of the great journeys that we can do is just get out of our own bodies for a little while. That's what um, literature does. It's also what good filmmaking does, what good art does. It sort of allows us to escape ourselves uh, and our own little mundanities for a while and be part of a new mundanity or a new order. It's, it's exciting um, and, and, and it's part of the joy of, 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 of being around. Oh, but that's another thing I'm interested in, joy and, and, and access to grace and recovery. It, it, amid all the gloom and the, 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 the bad stuff that's around, you know, I live with homeless people in subway tunnels. I've lived with, uh, you know, Romani people in Slovakia. I've done research into the fairly dark corners. But the most interesting thing to me is to, to f try and come out of it with some sort of experience of grace, because I think that's true and accessible and real for us. It appears that McCann may be on the verge of even more success. According to the New York Times, there have been talks with the film producer about turning let the great world spin into a major motion picture. Jessica? Thank you, Roshana. Traditional Irish music and dance has been passed down through the generations. Musicians and dancers have moved from country pubs to the world stage, but have not lost touch with their roots. In places like the Cupping Room in Lower Manhattan, young dancers still come to kick up their heels. 219 West's Margaret Teich went there to catch the action, and later sat down with Mick Maloney, an NYU professor of Irish folklore and music, and Brendan Dolan, an Irish music teacher and archivist. One, two, three, four. Welcome. Thank you for being here. Uh, I guess I'd like to start off by saying, what is Irish music? Well, <laughs> what's the history of beef? <laughs> There's so many different kinds of Irish music, really. There's instrumental music, uh, which is uh, often called uh, dance music, as a, lo a lot of it is. There are songs from Ireland, and there are Irish-American songs as well. And around St. Patrick's Day, you hear a lot of uh, a lot of Americans uh, who think that the only Irish music there is is when Irish eyes are smiling. And, uh, you know, uh, we'll put the overalls in Mrs. Murphy's shoulder and I'll take you home again, Kathleen. But in a way, that's Irish too, because it uh, has an Irish theme. The way that you learn how to play is mostly by listening to other people. You might get a few formal lessons, but I certainly learn from just sitting in the, in, in the edge of groups in, in sessions, in, in bars in rural Ireland, just listening to people, older musicians play. There's something really uh, bubbly, energetic, lively about a lot of this music. What does it feel like to play this music or to dance, you know? Actually dancing. The time goes very, very quickly, and uh, you kind of lose your sense of where you are, and you, you lose sense of time. And I, I find the same kind of experience when you're when you're playing music. If it's going well, and you're playing well with the people you're with, then time just flies. I feel like I have some connection to my Irish ancestors. It just it feels really good. 
Well, funnily enough, when I, when I was learning this music in Ireland and playing it, for the most part, it's dance music, but there was very little dancing, if, if any dancing at all. Now, the dance is there in the music, the rhythm that you alluded to, the fact your fingers are dancing, your body's moving in a funny way internally, and you're, playing, you're, play, you're not playing metronomically, you're playing with a certain lift and swing that is really part of an oral tradition which is very much related to this kind of dancing that Brendan was talking about. It, it's very much uh, body to body music and you're listening to the person beside you and it becomes a kind of a communication and every time you play it, it's going to be a little bit different. When, yeah. when tr traditional musicians play together, they're all playing the same melody, but they're not playing it the same way. And there's, there's a great uh, freedom in what you can do to the notes. The thing is we can play these pieces forever and it's going to be different every time. So that's why we don't get bored. Now, if Brendan plays that, it'll sound different. What's happening there is we're both putting in micro ornamentations. We're starting with da dee da 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 dee da da, but you can go da dee da 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 dee dee dum da 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 da. this community fresh in a time that's changing and, and kids aren't as interested in doing that, you know, sitting up next to these guys at a pub and, you know, it's not a rural community, especially in a place like New York City. For a tradition like this to survive, it has to be imaginatively relevant in every generation. If it isn't, it become a museum piece or you just find a bunch of old geezers playing it, you know. And a lot of traditions end up dying. Um, you know, I can think of many in Europe that end up dying with the Industrial Revolution. But I think something happens with Irish music. It's very much connected to the present. And because it's so deeply grounded, we're not afraid of adding things like electronic instruments, adding keyboards. Brendan would play electronic keyboards. We're not afraid of collaborations with with, uh, with other um, musicians or dancers and say something like river dance. When you're strong at the core, uh, collaboration is a very good thing and enhances the tradition because it doesn't damage or, or threaten the core, the core tradition. And I think that that kind of innovation has to take place in every generation for people to be drawn in, otherwise it will become a museum piece. That is a very, a very much not the case with Irish music. Music is a universal language. It's been used for social protest and it's been used to rally people around a common cause. 219 West, Mary Grace Murphy picks up the story. The nonprofit group Irish American Writers and Artists held a fundraiser for Haiti at a performance space over a midtown Manhattan Irish pub. The theme of the event was Island People Helping Island People. Most of us who descended from Irish immigrants are somehow related to the Irish potato family. That's where it all began for the Irish in America. And that was a huge disaster that displaced almost the entire population of, of the island of Ireland. And uh, the United States became a source of refuge for Irish immigrants. And we all descend from, from an island culture that was born of trauma. And I think uh, for those of us who have a consciousness about that, when we see things like uh, the earthquake in Haiti, we feel a strong connection to, to 
that sort of trauma and tragedy. We feel a, a historical connection uh, that resonates very strongly with Irish Americans. The music of globally minded Irish Americans provided a soundtrack for people making donations to Concern Worldwide, a Dublin based aid agency that has been in Haiti for 16 years. With the help of a $50,000 donation from the Irish government announced by Labor Affairs Minister Derek Cleary, the event raised $107,000 by the end of the night. And that's cause for celebration. For 219 West, I'm Mary Grace Murphy. New York has been a refuge to many groups in their times of need. Waves of immigrant communities have settled here over time, and for French-speaking immigrants and visitors, a church in Chelsea has been a beacon. Now its future is in jeopardy. Amy Berryhill has the story. For almost 170 years, New York's French-speaking Catholics have come to worship in their native language at St. Vincent de Paul Church even though it is the only French language Catholic church in the city, the archdiocese intends to close it. For the parishioners, such an action ignores the significance and legacy that to them extends beyond religion. The history about uh, the first church which received black and white people together, this is essential. So we can't uh, leave this church. You know, it's the church that we have in our heart. The Archdiocese of New York announced plans to close St. Vincent de Paul in 2006. During that time, parishioners created a nonprofit group and have applied the church to receive landmark status several times. And we feel that if we are strong enough right now, before we wait for the, uh, for the uh, Archdiocese, we will definitely have something incredible and you cannot say no. You will be obliged to say yes, okay. A spokesperson for the Landmark Preservation Commission refused to be interviewed, but said one reason the church had not been designated as a landmark is because the original facade was replaced. In addition, a house of worship must have broad significance beyond one particular group. Just how broad is being called into question. What I mean by French-speaking community, you know we have some 63 countries which share this uh, language. And here you have quite a huge representation. You will see from the attendance today that you will have a good turnout of people coming from, not necessarily from Chelsea, but from different parts of Manhattan and even, uh, I mean, the Bronx, even Brooklyn, and even New Jersey or Connecticut for some of them because, as I say, they want to worship in their language. The Commission cannot provide an answer for the third landmark designation decision, but the previous two attempts have been denied. The Archdiocese has no set time frame for the closure of the parish. A lawsuit has now been filed against the chairman of the Landmarks Preservation Commission, challenging the way he has handled the matter. The city has until March 26 to respond to the suit. Parishioners hope their prayers will be answered. We'll keep you posted. David? That's this month's edition of 219 West from the CUNY Graduate School of Journalism. Thank you for watching us. I'm David Montalvo. And I'm Jessica Cordemosh. Next month, we'll have more stories about the people and issues of New York City, and we hope you will find your way back to us. You can also catch our episodes on iTunes. From all of us here at 219 West, take care. Okay.